רני מקשר עצמי לכל הצדיקים האמיתיים של רבנו ולכל הצדיקים האמיתיים שוכני עפר קדושים אשר בארץ המה ובפרט לרבנו הקדוש צדיק יסוד עולם נחל נובע מכל חכמה רבנו נחמן פגל בן שמחה נער נח נחמן נחמן נאום הדרכותו תגן עלינו ועל כל ישראל אמן Okay, we're going to start Torah Yud of the Kutah Moran, Lesson 10 of the Kutah Moran. Very famous Torah, Rabbi Nachman gave about seven, eight years before he passed away, right before Purim. This Torah speaks about the subject of Purim in depth, Mordechai ve'ester, the entire Geula, how Rabbi Nachman already hinted to us, we'll actually start with this in Yen probably. In Lesson 74 of the second volume of the Kutah Moran, Rabbi Nachman says Purim is a preparation for Pesach, but essentially that what? That... In the beginning, we said that Pesach is the start of everything. Meaning what? That Pesach is the subject of all our redemption. We speak about Pesach and Yetzirah Mitzrayim 50 times in the entire Torah. It's the fundamental point of the Torah, the first of the Ten Commandments. Everything about leaving Egypt. Rabbi Nachman says though, now, this final Geula will follow the theme of Purim. No longer Pesach. To the Chidush. Honestly, before we get started in this subject, we're going to start here. We're going to start here, Baruch Hashem. So look at this. Torah Ein Dalet. I'm going to bring it here. Achar Purim Korin Parashat Parah. After Purim, we read Parashat Parah. You know those four parashiot that we read? Four special Shabbatot. Parah is right after Purim. Shehu Achana Pesach. Why? Because Parah is a preparation for Pesach. Why? Because in order to perform the Korban Pesach, we need to be pure. And the para aduma was what purified us. Anyone who is impure would be purified through the ashes of the para aduma. Ki parashat para korim kedesh yu mizarin etayar mitumat bet. Because we read parashat para, which speaks about the people being essentially careful, the people being told to be careful from tumat bet, from the defilement of the dead. Essentially not to get in contact with the dead body, not to be in the same room as the dead body, to, prov- to make us pure enough so that we can give the korban pesach. <coughs> so that we should be pure to perform the Korban Pesach. In the beginning, it's the Pur, the lottery. Because obviously in Purim we say, Ki pil pul hua goal. They give the lottery, which is the Goal. That's what Haman did. He did a lottery to find out which day to exterminate the Jewish people. What, which thing did he land on? The 14th of Adar. So what was the Inyan? That... Um, that Haman did a lottery to perform the extermination of the Jewish people. So Purim starts with a lottery. Purim obviously comes from the word Pur, which means lottery. That's where it comes from. Ki Purim al Shema Pur, because we know that Purim has brought down the Kavanot of the Ari Kadosh, the Arizal. Besod Hipil Pur, Besod Para Aduma, that all the Indian of Purim surrounds around this idea. Para, Pur, it's all the same Shoresh. See how it's all around the same subject. Ve'achakach nase Para, but after Pur, after the word Pur, which is the lottery, we transform it into Parah, which is the cow, the red heifer. Because Rabbi Nachman is saying, Purim is certainly the direction and the derech on the way to Pesach. Meaning, you cannot get to Pesach before you go to Purim. Before you want to get to Pesach, you have to first go to the subject of Purim and the theme of Purim. It's impossible to get to Pesach. The subject of Geulah uh, Mitzrayim before you go to the Inyan of Purim. This is what is brought down in Shir Sifto'tav shoshanim notfot morover. His lips were shoshanim, were like roses, notfot morover, dripping with flowing mor, a certain type of spice. His lips were like roses, flowing, the rip, roses are red, like the lips are red, flowing with the spice, mor. What does that mean? Sifto'tav, what does lips have to do with anything? So Rabbi Nachman is going to explain. Sifto'tav, Sifto'tav is a bechinat pesach, that's represent pesach, the lips represent pesach. Why? Because the Arizal says Pesach. Pesach is brought down the Kavanot um, of the Ari Kadosh. Pesach is a play on the uh, play on the words Pesach, the mouth that speaks. Kamuva is brought down. Where is it brought down? Pri Etzchayim Chagamatzot in the book of Pri Etzchayim. Shoshana, when it says Siftotav Shoshani, his lips were like Shoshani. So he said the lips are like Pesach. But what Shoshana? Shoshana represents who? Esther. How? Shoshana has the same numerical value as Esther. Shin, Vav, Shin, and Nun, He. Gematria 661, the same numerical value as Esther, which is 661. As brought down in Zohar Kadosh and the writings of the Arizal. 
Notefot morover. His lips were flowing like a, were, fl- were flowing like a mor. What is mor? The pronoun mordechai. Mor over is mordechai. Mor obviously comes from mordechai. We know his source in the Torah is Badan Cholin, Gemara Cholin, that it asks over there, where is the source for mordechai in the Torah? Where do we find mordechai in the Torah? Mor derok. That's the answer. What is brought down, um, it says, what mor derok? This, uh, this spice, one of the spices. Leshon cherut. But what does derog come from? The word derog comes from the cherut, freedom. Mor derog is a spice that's mentioned in the Torah. That's the source for mor derog. Mor derog. And it says over there, meradachia. It's brought down in the Targum. It's all the same idea. But derog, actually, the language of derog represents freedom. Cherut. Bechinat cherut she Pesach, the freedom of Pesach. Which means what? Therefore, we see the Tzeruf of Purim, the combination of the letters of Purim. Merubat Pesach is hidden in Pesach. As brought down like this, Bapasuk in the verse. I'm going to tie a full circle here because all a ton of the different stuff, Rabbi Nachman is bringing all the ideas together. Brought down Shemot chapter Chav Gimel, chapter 23. Shiva Tzanim Tocha Matzot, Ka'asher Tzividicha Lemoed, Chod Deshaviv, Kivo Yatzat Amim Tzayim. Velo Yerau Fanai Rekam. What does that mean? Shiva Tzanim Tocha Matzot, you're going to eat Matzah for seven days. Just like you commanded us at the appointed time, at the month of the spring, which is what? Nisan, Pesach. You're going to eat the matzot at the right time within the month of spring, which is Pesach, which is Nisan. So what's the appointed time? Obviously the 15th of Nisan. Hashem is commanding us to eat matzot during the month of spring. Okay? Because that's the month you left Egypt. And you shall, appear, you shall not appear for, before me empty-handed. Meaning when you're going to do Aliyah la Regel, when the Jewish people are going to come up every single year to the Bet HaMikdash, you're not going to come up empty-handed. Okay? You will not see my... Sorry, you don't appear before me empty-handed. So now, Rabbi Nachman is going to explain this out here. Look at the words. Take the first letters. Mi Mitzrayim, you have Velo Vav. Yerau Yud, Panai Pe, Rekam Resh, Rashet Yevot Purim. Take the first letter of the phrase, Mimitzrayim Velo Yerau Panai Rekam. Take the first letter, you mix them around, you get Purim. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman is explaining that Purim is a preparation for Pesach. Before you leave Egypt, you have to first go through the theme of Purim. Ki Purim u derech le Pesach. Because Purim is a way to Pesach. That's the way to Pesach. If you want to get to the Soda Pesach to leave Egypt, you first have to go to Purim. Why? Because Purim starts with Purim and then it goes through Para, the red heifer, which purifies us so that we can perform the Pesach. So Purim is a start. Because you cannot get to Para before the pool, before the lottery. That's the way the Ari Kadosh is explaining, Rabbi Nachman is explaining that Pur turns into Para, Para turns into Pesach, okay? And through this, we're able to perform, we're able to protect ourselves from chametz. That the way a person performs the mitzvot of Purim will actually enable him to perform the mitzvah of Pesach and to protect himself from chametz. Rabbi Nachman is explaining. The more you engage in the mitzvah of Purim, the more you do the mitzvah of Purim, the more you fulfill the mitzvah of Purim, the more you'll be protected from chametz on Pesach. Because they're one idea. So now, Rabbi Nachman stopped in the middle of the idea and did not reveal anymore. But he finished off like this. This is the famous phrase. Ki hayu kol mi Pesach. In the beginning, meaning in Jewish history, kol all the beginnings, hayu Pesach. They started from Pesach. Meaning, if we wanted to teach something, if we wanted to teach a hatkala, a beginning of something, and a beginning of a redemption, a beginning of a new life, we always started from the theme of Pesach. Because Pesach is the most famous. The Alken, and therefore, we see that all the mitzvot are really a remembrance for Mitzrayim. When we do Kiddush on Yom Tov, we say, Everything is Zecher Litziyad Mitzrayim. A remembrance for the time we left Egypt. But now, dot, dot, dot. We don't see him. He did not finish. Rabbi Nathan says, on the Sinyan, we can see the Kavana of Rabbeinu is that what? All the beginnings are from Purim. 
which means the main theme for the final redemption is no longer on the theme of Pesach anymore. It's on the theme of Puri. And what's the proof of it? Rabbi Nachman is going to get into it a little bit more in this lesson, lesson 10. Because Purim is going to begin touching a descent. That the redemption of Purim touches a descent that was lower than that when we left Egypt. When we left Egypt, we were at the 49th gate of Tuba. I brought down the writings of the Ari Akadosh and the Zohar Akadosh that we entered the 49th gate of impurity. Had we entered the 50th gate, we would have never left. The 49th gate of impurity were the state in which we were in during Egypt. But Purim is worse. Because Purim is on the theme of something even below the 50, below the 49th, which is the 50th gate. It's when a person falls off from the 70 facets of the Torah. Rabbi Nachman teaches us. A person, sometimes, to his sins, can fall off of one um, facet of the Torah. We know the Shivim Parim Torah. 70 faces to the Torah. 70 ways to interpret the Torah. So a person can fall off, if a person does one sin or maybe falls on one, under one level, he'll fall off from one face of the Torah. A person though, because of many sins, and specifically Rabbi Nachman brings this down, whenever a person falls into the Taba for food, very interesting Taba, that person can fall from all 70 faces of the Torah. All 70. And in that case, when a person falls off from all 70 faces of the Torah, he doesn't know he's asleep. It's a astara, shabetoka astara. You're asleep, you don't even know you're asleep. So you can't even wake up because you don't even know you're sleeping. You're in a coma. So how do you wake up from that? Stories. Rabbi Nachman explained this in Lesson 60. Sipo e Masyot. Stories of ancient times. So why Rabbi Nachman wrote the book, Sipo e Masyot. All these stories are meant to wake up the individual, the neshama, when it falls into a place below the 70 facets of the Torah. Because in that place, in the Sipo e Masyot, Mishani Kalimot, Story, time, story tales of ancient, ancient times. In, that, in those stories, you have all the 70 facets of the Torah within there. So that when a person hears the story, he's able to wake up from all 70 facets because he's going through the Shoresh, he's going through the root. So when a person falls off from, from all 70 faces of the Torah, what ends up happening is that he cannot wake up. He doesn't know how to wake himself up. He doesn't know what he looks like anymore. But now, through the story, time, story tales of ancient, ancient times, then a person can wake up. And that's what Rabbi Nachman is teaching here. We're going to get a little bit more into the subject, which is why Megillah Tester is read like a story, why we read in Megillah that it has to be scrolled, it has to be like completely rolled out like an entire story, it has to be read like a Megillah, like a scroll. Why? Because the entire sod of Purim happens through the story. There's actually a very unique thing about Purim, that when Esther sent Ezra a sofer, Megillah Tester, Ezra Sofer did not want to include it part of Tanakh. He did not want to put Megillat Esther part of the 24th book of Tanakh. Because he thought this is... There's no name of Hashem in the book. There's, he didn't even see something godly about the story. Why was Esther so adamant about including Megillat Esther as part of Tanakh? Because she realized that the only way out of the Galut is through the story. How? Because you don't see Hashem in Barach clearly in the Forash, explicitly in the Torah, like you see Yudke, Vavke, or Elohim, none of that. It's only HaMelech, HaMelech, HaMelech. <coughs> the king, the king, the king. That's all it says in the, in the Megillah Tester, HaMelech, HaMelech. What's the Inyan, though? That Esther is hinting to Ezra Sofer that the only way out of the final Galut is through Sipo and Masyot, ancient story time, ancient story tales. Mishanim Kalmonio from ancient times, meaning stories that are able to touch the Neshama from the Shohesh. We're going to explain how that corresponds to Mordechai. It's an entire Likut el it's an entire Inyan that Rabbi Nathan explains. But here we see something very special, is that Megillat Esther holds a very unique place in the final Geulah. In fact, the final Geulah will follow the theme of Megillat Esther. Why? Everything is concealed. Esther comes from the word Hastara, concealment but yet everything is completely loaded with Hashem's providence, Hashkacha. And that's the story of the final redemption. How every single person, every single individual has a unique elokut within him, a godliness within him, and how Hashem Yibach is manifesting itself within each and every person essentially, and doing awesome things that we can't even see. It's beyond the, the bare eye. Because you have to look beyond the surface. 
Purim, we see, and on Pesach, we see miracles, the Tel Makot, we see things that we can't even imagine. Purim, totally different. Purim, everything happens under the realm of nature. Everything. And it, that's the biggest Geulah. Because that's what's going to touch the people who hit below the 50th gate of impurity, which is where we are right now, Rabbi Nachman says. Rabbi Nachman says, we've sunken below the Nun Shale Tumah. We're below that which we were in Egypt. Which means we need, a, we need a, a redemption that goes much higher. And that's why it's going to follow the theme of Purim. Because that's the low we hit during Purim. So I actually want to bring this down here in Papa Le Chochma. Look what he says here in Ayn Dalit about this subject. Very special Indian here. אמר רמחה בראיין חסד לאברהם אין הקורא נאר נזאין ששלושים יום קודם לפסח מתחיל הקדוש ברוך הוא לוציא נפשות ישראל מאחלות התומה מאד מאד. זה לא דמה חסד לאברהם. Holy Sefer. Look what it brings down over there. That thirty days before Pesach, Hashem Yidbarach begins to take out the souls of the Jewish people from the hechlot atuma mead mead, from the chambers of impurity, little by little. It's following the theme that we just mentioned in this lesson, that you cannot get to Pesach before you go through Purim. Meaning what? 30 days before Pesach, Hashem Midbarach is taking the souls of Jewish people out from the chambers of impurity. Little by little. When is 30 days before Pesach? Bijuk Purim. On the day of Purim. So that on the night when we burn Chametz, which is the 14th of Pesach, 14th of Nisan, which is the same, a month before 14th of Nisan is the 14th of Adar, which is Purim. So exactly a month later after the, the day of Purim, we begin to burn the Chametz. At night, we take a spoon, we take a feather, we take a candle, and we begin to search the entire house to search for Chametz. And we burn the Chametz. Why? Meaning what? Kol posh Israel omdin ba-Petach. Ayin Sham, it brings down over there that all the Jewish, all the sinners of the Jewish people stand at the entrance at the night of the Ochametz. What that means, I have to look over there, I didn't look into it. Shat Chalat HaTikun Shet Pesach Matchil Milet Purim. So he says look over there, but the idea is that what? That the beginning of the rectification of Pesach, the Tikun of Pesach, Yetziat Mitzrayim, starts with Purim. Veze Shekatu Bashulchan Aruch Siman Tav Chavtet this is what is written in Shulchan Aruch, in, in the book of Rabbi Yosef Karo, in um, Siman 429, We begin to ask about the Halachot of Pesach 30 days before Pesach starts. That before, it's a, it's, it's a Minhag, Minhag said that before 30 days before Yom Tov, before Achag, we begin to study the Halachot about the Achag. So 30 days before Pesach is exactly the Yom Tov. And that's exactly when we start studying the Halachot of Pesach, which is why it's a Segula, very important, that whenever on Purim, it's very important to start, start even the first Halachot of Shulchan Aruch on Pesach. Why? Because Purim is a Hachana of Pesach. Purim is a preparation for Pesach. Um, and this is why we start on the day of Purim itself. Coming to show us a little bit more about the subject, that Purim is a preparation for Pesach. And if you want to get to Pesach, which is the entire Yetziat Mitzrayim, the leaving of Galut, which we're in right now, it's all through the theme of Purim. Now, what is Purim? Now, that's what Rabbi Nachman explains in Lesson 10. So, to understand Lesson 10, you didn't understand how he gave the lesson. Look at this. Rabbi Nachman, before Purim, gave this Torah. This is about eight years before he passed away. It's brought down over there. So what does it bring down over there? That it brought down in Sichotaran. Um, oh, sorry. In Chayim Oran, also in Sichotaran, that Rabbi Nathan was saying that when he wrote this lesson before Rabbi Nachman, meaning when he was recopying this lesson that he heard from Rabbi Nachman, lesson 10, what did he do? He began to write a lesson, start a lesson with this subject, which is what? Shesh dinim chasver Hashem Yisrael ayder ikudim amchad kaf naaseh hamtakat adinim. Rabbi Nachman famously teaches when there's judgments upon the Jewish people, when there's decrees on the Jewish people through dancing, lifting your feet and clapping your hands, you're able to sweeten the judgments. 
When you have a deen on you, both personally, and a deen on the Jewish people collectively, meaning at a personal level and a collective level, the way to sweeten the judgment is to clap and to dance. To clap your hands and to dance. So that's Chidush. Rabbi Nachman didn't explain this according to the Zohar and everything later. But Rabbi, Na- when Rabbi Nathan was copying this, Rabbi Nathan was in front of him. Rabbi Nachman was in front of him. Amalin, Rabbi Nachman was telling Rabbi Nathan, Kachamati, so I say. This is like I say. What do I say? He said that now we can hear that decrees are happening on the Jewish people. At that time, there was a tremendous decree happening on the Jews of Eastern Europe. And Rabbi Nachman is saying, but the days of Purim are approaching. Because we know this Torah was given right before Purim. Everything Rabbi Nachman did at a Torah perspective when he gave a lesson was big yuk so precise to what was happening in the moment. Just to give you a, an idea, one time, lesson 29 of the Gitemora, I'm just going to give you a random example, just to show you how precise it is, how much Ruach HaKodesh is involved. One time, Rabbi Nathan used to, ha- Rabbi Anu used to give Torah on very certain occasions. He used to give Shiorim on very certain occasions. He used to give out a Torah lesson. One of those occasions was like Shabbat Nachamu, Shabbat Chanukah, you know, all these different types of uh, Mu'adim. Shavuot, Rosh Shana, all these ideas. One time, it was one night. I think it could have been a Friday night or something. I forget when. Um, it could have been one of the holidays. Nonetheless, Rabbi Nachman is giving Torah 29 of the Kutu Moran, Speaking about the Tikkun HaKavi. About Tikkun HaBrit. Rectifying the covenant. And that's the first time he mentions the Tikkun HaKavi. <laughs> Look at this. A person, one of Rabbi Nachman's followers, came to him that night. He had, he had no idea he was coming. Or he had no idea he was coming. But no information involved. He just came and he brought his daughter. This man. His daughter had epilepsy. She was very sick. Rabbi Nachman, within the lesson, lesson 29, teaches us the remedy on how to, how to treat epilepsy. Through the Tikkun Akali. And why the Tikkun Akali is a Tikkun for epilepsy. How the Tikkun Akali represents repairing the mind, repairing your dot, and how epilepsy is whenever the blood rushes to the brain and damages the brain. Too much pressure on the mind. Rabbi Nachman explains through the lesson how epilepsy is healed. The source for epilepsy and why you can repair it through the Tikkun Akali. And how the Tikkun Akali is the Tikkun for it. Coming to show you the, the, the Ruach HaKodesh involved. So when Rabbi Nachman, anytime something is happening in the world, what was happening in his time, he always gave a lesson that was, happening, that was applicable to what was presently occurring. So in that time, Rabbi Nachman and all the tzaddikim were hearing about the decrees of the Jewish people that the Tsar of Ukraine and Russia was going to draft all the Jewish kids into the army, shave their peyot, shave their peyot, and completely affiliate them um, within um, secular, modern society. Make them carry weapons on Shabbat and make them fight in the army. Literally, to go die off in some random hole. That was the decrees that were happening. It was called the punctin, the points, the bullet points. That was happening at the time of the Tsar of Ukraine, where the Tsar of Ukraine was releasing these punctin, or there was talk about his punctin being finalized and going through, like, to be passed as a law. And when Rabbi Nachman heard of this, he said that tzaddikim aren't taking this law seriously because they think, how could Hashem do this to the Jewish people? Rabbi Nachman said, though, we've seen Hashem Barak do this many times in the past, unfortunately. And we must take these decrees very seriously to try to sweeten the judgments. Look at this. Rabbi Nachman said, after the Purim, whenever he taught this lesson, he spoke about the dancing and the clapping. After Purim, he said, Baruch Hashem, I was successful in pushing off this decree 20 some odd years. 25 years later, from Purim that year, the decree that the Pukhtin came out. 25 years. But what was Rabbi Nachman's Kavanah here? That a Jew, through the simple practical application of the, the advice that he's giving, through dancing and clapping your hand, which is what he did on Purim, you can push off decrees, both personally and collectively. Meaning what? What's the kavana? Rabbi Nachman saying, and Rabbi Nathan emphasizes this a thousand times. The main kavana, when you take Rabbi Nachman's words, is to apply the simple divorim. 
It's as deep as it gets. It goes to the Zohar, the Midrashim, the Ari Kadosh, the Gemara. It goes through every part of the Torah. Pshat Rem is Drash and so. We're talking about the deepest secret of the Torah here. But the main thing Rabbi Nathan says is to bring it down to Ipshitut and to apply what he says in simplicity because that's the main Kamanah Rabbi Nathan wanted. The depth is infinite. The main thing that he's teaching us is the practical application. The massive. What do I do? And look what he says here. Rabbi Nachman saying that the Jewish people, when it comes to Purim, they'll be dancing and clapping their hands. And through this, the judgment will be sweetened. And he repeated these words. And he said again, So I've said. His kavanah was so that we should uh, awaken our hearts. So this is what that when he's saying like this, the first line of the Torah, when there's, God forbid, judgment upon the Jewish people, through dancing and clapping hand to hand, you are able to sweeten the judgments, to remove these judgments. And that's what Rabbi Nachman's Kavanah was. To dance and to clap your hand. You're feeling a suffering, go clap and dance your hand. Go clap and uh, go dance and clap your hands. And that's uh, what happened with Rabbi Nachman's daughter. Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman's daughter, could have been Salah, I forget who, came to Rabbi Nachman with a toothache. Back then, they didn't know how to treat that stuff, obviously, with doctors and everything. Complicated is that she was going through a very big suffering. So she came to her father and she said, Abba, I'm really not feeling well. My tooth is hurting. You know what Rabbi told her? Lock yourself in your room and go dance. Said what? <laughs> Go do it. She listened. If she took, started dancing. One minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Got out of the room and said, "Abba, I don't feel anything." Said this is the power of dancing. Dancing, mamash. Not only is it take off any dinim, it's refua. Because simcha is refua for all the cholamot, right? Rabbi Nachman teaches us, Mitzvah gedola liot besimcha tamid. Mitzvah, it's a very big mitzvah to be happy always. And what did he say over there? That mitzvah, it's a, when you're besimcha, you're able to re- remove all your sicknesses. Simcha is a refua for all sicknesses. Any sickness you can imagine, it's a refua. From Chaz Shalom, the biggest sickness of cancer to anything else. Simcha is the biggest healing in the world. Rabbi Nachman explains it, the secret of this with regard to the Zohar, the pulse, how the pulse is damaged through sadness, and how you repair the pulse through song, which is simcha. But we see here that dancing is the way of simcha. Which is why in Purim it's such a big mitzvah to dance. And we're going to explain why the dancing is even bigger than the clapping. Because it requires a lot more koach to lift your feet up than it does to clap your hands. I mean, Ahmed at the end of the lesson is going to explain the connection between Mordechai and Esther. And how Mordechai represents the hands, but how Esther represents the feet. That which is Nistar, hidden. The Geola, mainly, comes to Esther, not Mordechai. Which means it comes from the, from the, the regal, from the feet. What did it say in uh, Mishle? Ragle hayodot mavet, I think. Her feet descend down to the death. Where are the feet? The feet represent Malchut. It's the lowest sphira, but it's the Malchut, it's attached to the Klippa. The lowest level of holiness is always attached to the, to the impurity. It's always closest to the impurity. Because it goes in a ladder, essentially. So the lowest level is always going to be closest to that which is impure. The feet is the closest thing to tuma, to impurity. Which is why there's no purity for the feet anymore. You can't even do netilat adam on the feet anymore because they're so tamen. The hand, we can repair. We do netilat adam in the morning. The feet has no reparation. Because the feet have already descended down to the klipa, to the evil forces. But through dancing, you lift them out. Dancing is the way you lift the feet out of the galut. Which is what? How you lift the malchut 
قرار بده رو هایو لیفت شخینا آر بگدار All the secrets here about Purim and the final Geula are all hidden within the secret of dancing and clapping Crazy secrets um, And that's what Rabbi Nachman said <coughs> What did he said? And he said, I pushed this off for 20 odd years, right? And 25 years later, it came into being this, uh, this thing. But it comes to show us that what? That when a person dances and claps, he's able to push off in the trees. But I think it's a good introduction to the lesson. Honestly, whoever wants to start, who wants to start? The first line. Go, go for it, bro. So these are the Mishpati in the laws that you shall place before them. Rabenu, he's going to push that verse aside like Rabenu the way and he's going to come to it at the end of the Torah, the end of the lesson to teach us how all the things that he's teaching is hidden within that verse. Okay? These are the mishpatim that you shall place before them. Okay, put that aside. Now we're going to enter to the subject. Yara. Kesheyesh chaz v'shalom dinim al Israel al yidir chikudim. What we were talking about, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what's chikudim? Chikudim is dancing. Ah, dancing. Cool. Okay. V'amir v'amir at kaf el kaf naase. So that's look at look at look at the beauty behind here. Should we see it? You wanna you wanna try? Um kaf el kaf. Well, kaf el kaf. So we do have palm to palm. When you push one palm to one palm, okay. Naase hamtaka tadini. You create a hamtaka, a sweetening of the dini. Yeah. For the judgment. Meaning what? When a chazir Israel is overcome by zerot and dini and all the things you can imagine, the worst decrees. The way out is dancing and clapping. Okay? Now this is a very unique inyan. <coughs> Where is the... Here? No, no, no. I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I didn't have that. here? No. Okay. Okay. So we continue. Who wants to move? Kika. Do you want to? Do you want to? Sam? Kika. Kika, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to? Uh, Continue un because the essence, the, now Rabbi Nachman is going to explain the Kabbalah. The greatest aspect of Hashem Barach, the essence of God's greatness. You want to go to the greatest, you, you want to understand when Hashem is greatest? When is Hashem at the highest, Madriga? When, when can we exalt Hashem the most? When is Hashem greatest? When the Avodat Kochavim, when the Goyi. And the other nations, the Gentiles, Yedu, that they should know Sheyesh Elokim Shem to Moshe. When they come to recognize that there's a God that is a ruler, that he's Shem to Moshe, that he exercises his rulership. Would you say that is like right now, though? Like right, you're saying right yeah, now? Right now, in our, uh, yeah, in our age. You're saying that this is happening? I would say so. Interesting. The Muslims, they, they believe we have the same God, it's number one. Number two, the Christians are finally coming out to believe that there's actually is a God and not just Jesus. <laughs> it's very possible. It's very possible. I mean, each and every person at a personal level exalts Hashem's name in that regard, exactly like you're saying. Now, when we say, what do they say? What do they say? That they should know that there's an Elohim Shari to Moshe. Meaning they come to recognize the God of the Jewish people. You're right. At a person, at a level that the same God of the, the yeah. Muslims, is, uh, uh, the same God of Abraham is the same God of the Jewish people. They have some 
there, it's not 100% accurate in the way we view it, obviously, because they mess up some of the Midot of Hashem Yidbarach. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we believe that Hashem Yidbarach has 10 Sfirot and the way he manifests in the world and all these Inanim. Different. Nonetheless, nonetheless, when they come to recognize, yes, it's very possible that they're bringing a very big Dula to Hashem Yidbarach. But specifically, when it com- one comes to recognize the God of the Jewish people and says, they're yeah, right. Let's mess up many times, right? Yeah. But by the way, you see, you see people like this. You see it. Those people who keep the seven or convert, convert. Exactly. That's exactly where it's going to get up to. By the way, it's not, the principle doesn't only belong to someone who's a, a goy. Rabbin is coming to give a chidush here that specifically the principle applies to someone who's very far. Meaning what? Someone who's rachok in Hashem Yitbarach. Someone who's far from Hashem Yitbarach. When he comes to recognize Hashem's greatness, this is a very big thing for Hashem. A bar tshuva. Idolaters, I guess a good word. Exactly, yeah. meaning a person who is in the aspect of Abu or a person who is in the aspect of a lack of emunah. But what about, like, what about someone who's off the deck? Yeah, when he comes back, you know, I'm going to... Yeah, no, that's like, you say, like, what, a thousand lives or something, no? Yeah, I don't know it's what like, the number is, but like, it's a, it's it, a lot. It's a lot, yeah. Because you're, imagine, you're not only saving yourself, you're saving generations to come, you're saving other people, so because Kodi Salah, that means that There's Indian we don't understand. What I can tell you is this. He brings the example of Yitro, Rabbeinu. Why? Because he brought that in Kadosh. Kedeni When Yitro came and said, Ki yadati ki gadol Hashem, ki gadol Hashem, mikola Elohim, for Hashem is barach, is above all the other gods, meaning what? That the Inyan of Yitro was coming to recognize that all the other gods he served before were clearly, they were nothing. Only Hashem is barach is the one. When he did that, the Zohar Kadosh says the name of Hashem was exalted like never before in history. Never before. Hashem's name elevated itself to the highest level possible. Why? Because Yitro, who's the biggest priest, Kohen Midian, the priest of Midian, he's literally the biggest idolater in the world, comes and says Hashem Yitbarach. It's like imagine the Pope right now comes and says Hashem Yitbarach, you're, you're it. And the Jewish people, I'm with you. And the Torah is in it. Imagine, you know what that does? Uh, Mashiach probably is here. Because when someone so far comes close, that's Hashem's greatness. Because what's Hashem's greatness? That He can associate with those who are far. How do you know someone is great? By the fact of how He lowers Himself. Meaning what? Sometimes people think Tzadikim are very big Tzadikim because they're so separated from Kedusha. They're, they're so alone. They're so Kadosh. Rabbi Nachman says the bigger the Tzadik, the more he associates himself with the world. To the point where you can even get lost in thinking he's not even a tzaddik. One time Rabbi Nathan found Rabbi Nachman playing chess with some philosophers in Uman. This is a couple months before he passed away. Rabbi Nathan, every time Rabbi Nathan used to walk into Rabbi Nachman's house, he used to have like very big ira because obviously when you see a tzaddik, Tzadik Bechina Moshe Rabbeinu, like a neshama like this, and you're about to walk into his house, imagine the fear you're feeling on your face right now that you're about to go speak to him. You don't even know what to say. You're, you're so afraid. And no, you have to have, have yirah from your rebbe. So, he always used to go back and forth and shuffle between the house or not, whether to walk in or not. So Rabbi Nachman playing chess and these philosophers are speaking to him like it's like their best friend, like some casual guy, like I'm speaking to some... Some random guy across the street. Playing chess. Rabbi Nathan looks at Rabbi Nachman. He says, Rabbi He says, do you play chess with them? He says, how can you? He, said, he asked him at a question at Abu Dhabi Hashem. He said, how can you play chess with people so far? How can you engage with people so far? He says, and he says, what? And me speaking to you is, the same, is not the same thing? Meaning what? For Rabbi the, the level of the tzaddik is so high when you talk about Moshe Rabbeinu for him the difference between <laughs> a zaken and someone else is it's he's dealing with the same inyan here obviously we're not going to compare Rabbi Nathan Rabbi Nathan was a tzaddik beyond our imagination here. but Rabbeinu said and he said but what speaking to you guys too is not the same thing meaning the separation indication is like here to here and then here to here you see it's not that big of a difference even though for us it's a massive difference between Rabbi Nathan and the philosopher. Mm-hmm. Especially if you knew who these philosophers were, they were already shining beyond imagination. 
Rabbi Nachman made them do tshuva like crazy. You, I mean, these philosophers pushed out Rabbi Levi Tzach Min Berdichev from Uman. Rabbi Levi Tzach Min Berdichev wanted to settle his chassidut in Uman. Because every, t- every chassid, even the Bashan Tov saw Yanin, that Uman had a very special place because many Nishemot of Jewish people sacrificed their souls there. And there was lots of rectifications that needed to happen to the Nishamat. Many tzaddikim wanted to go there to rectify the souls. Obviously, they weren't successful because it requires a tzaddik at the Bechina that we're talking about here, like Rabbi Nachman Moshe Rabbein and Rabbi Shem Bayochai to repair Nishamat like this. The Rabbi David Tzaddik Be'atisha was kicked out by the same philosophers that told Rabbi Nachman to come. Rabbi Nachman waited eight years before he walked into Umar. You know, eight years before he walked into Umar. Eight years before he passed away, around this time maybe, Rabbi Nachman was traveling through Uman to go to Breslev. And as he was traveling through Uman, he did a Shabbat in Uman, and he looked at the cemetery, he said, that is a good place to be buried. Rabbi Nachman said, from that Dibo, we already understood that Rabbi Nachman chose his burial place for Uman. He did Shabbat there, and he encountered these philosophers that we're talking about, Hirschberg, Moshe, Landau, all these people. By the way, Rabbi Nathan calls him the Nachash Ado, the Metzach Nachash, the forehead of the snake of the generation. People that made a vow not to say Hashem's name because they completely denied God. These people we're talking about Jewish people that completely threw everything away, kafel, kafar ba'ika, they completely denied Hashem Bara, everything. They made a vow never to say God's name, so as not to give him importance. We're talking about people that despised God. <clears throat> they kicked out Rabbi Levi Tami Berdichev. Rabbi Nachman did a Shabbat there. And around so that Shishi time, Rabbi Nachman was doing Shabbat there. And the philosopher Hirschberg, who was the leading philosopher, he, they were one of the students of the leading philosopher at the time, Jewish guy. Um, I forget his name, um, Naftali Wazel. This man wrote books on philosophy person would read them, he would like lose it. You, you would completely lose your emuna, stuff like this. Question that we can't deny that. Called Yen Levanon, books like this. Regardless, their teacher was the, like, one of the best friends of the Tsar of Ukraine at the time. His students were these three philosophers who were running Uman. They were best friends to the Tsar, and they had essentially power to do whatever they wanted in the town. They were running the show. Rabbi Nachman is doing one Shabbat there. This is eight years before he goes to Uman. Rabbi Nachman went to Uman six months before he passed away. After this, he went to Breslev and he established his Hasidut in Breslev. He did Shabbat there. That Shabbat, so that Shishit comes or around that time. So the story is brought down in Kohle. Oh, the three philosophers knock at the door. They hear a big Hasid in town. They obviously want to come and give them their welcome. Give this man their welcome. They knock on the door. They say, we hear a certain Rabbi Nachman is in town. Rabbi Nachman looks at them and says, or they say, we see a big person is in town. He didn't say Rabbi Nachman. He said, we see a big person is in town. We'd love to see him. Rabbi Nachman looks at them and says, go across the street. The officer of the army is there. <laughs> Mock them a little bit. <laughs> Close the door. They got very embarrassed and obviously they're the ones running the town here. So they got busha. Like, they got mit bayesh. They got embarrassed. They left. They came back on Shabbat in another Makkah time. The attendant of Rabbi Nachman opened the door. Rabbi Nachman's sitting here, and like imagine the door is over there. Rabbi Nachman's looking at the three philosophers. These three philosophers came to Rabbi Nachman to test his wisdom. What did they come with? The question their teacher, a philosopher, came to the conclusion of at the end of his life. This teacher of these three philosophers spent his entire life building philosophy and wisdoms and foreign wisdom, the, the mashema, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, we never hear of such things. At the end of his life, the last week of his life, he sat in solitude and came up with the final question. He didn't even come up with an answer. He didn't even have the answer. He came up with the final question that he, <coughs> that, uh, that he didn't even come to the answer with. He passed away before he came up with the answer. Their student wanted to test Rabbi Nachman with the question. They come before Rabbi Nachman, before they even utter a word. Sorry, Baran and Kohveo. Rabbi Nachman looks at the three philosophers and answers the answer without the question. They didn't even ask anything. They're so taken aback, they 
they look at Rabbi Nachman and they say, I'm not even going to ask how you knew the answer. But the fact that you knew we were going to even ask, before you even, we even asked a question, you gave it to us. Meaning, how do you even do that? You know what Rabbi Nachman responded? From the hairs on your head, I know your thoughts. There's an entire Torah in the Kutim Oran, Rabbi Nachman explains how the hair is motarot of chokhmah, excess wisdom. Which is why it's good for a man to keep his hair short and there's an entire yanim, the peyot, and all the beard, the beard excess is all chachamim, but the, the, this part is din, all this stuff, you know? All these ideas. Rabbi Nachman says that through the hair on a person's head, that Sadiq is able, the Zohar speaks about his basha, through the hair on a person's head, you can understand a person's thoughts. The philosophers were so impressed. They were so impressed by this. They told Rabbi Nachman, essentially, we'll invite you back when it's time. There's an entire story about how it happened. They had a special book, Yen Lebanon, the, 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 uh, the Yen Lebanon, and uh, what do you call it? Rabbi Nachman, the guy opened up, the guy was, Hirsch Bear was reading through a page. Rabbi Nachman read the page to him without even reading it. Like a crazy story. Rabbi Nachman asked for the book, they did not give it to him. Rabbi, so what happened? Hirsch Bear said, when it's time for you to come to Uman, we'll send you the book. What, what book is that? This book of their teacher, Yen Good to see you, my book. Oh, okay, okay, so... So they were, they had this special book. Michael, can you close the door by any chance? Yeah, I got you. Thank you, okay. Why did you want the book? Yeah. Rabbi Nachman explained the lesson, Samen Dalek Likute Moran, that the tzaddik I met needs to study books of philosophy to repair nishamot that fall into those wisdoms. But only he can do it, because other nishamot don't understand how to navigate the levels of philosophy and understand how to elevate their soul or how to, how to stay holy within that. The Meaning, they'll fall. <laughs> they'll fall themselves. Only the, the, the Neshama Moshe Rabbeinu can go into that, into that wisdom. And when he studies it, he's able to repair the Neshama that have fallen and will fall into it. Very deep lesson, lesson 64. Lots of secrets there. Did finally, did, did they do uh, Teshuvah? So, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, it's crazy yeah. actually. It's a crazy story. So, so they were from uh, Uman? Yeah, yeah. They were Jews and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah were, I know, but know, from Uman. They're from Uman. Um, eight years later, Rabbi Nachman in Breslev. The Breslev went on fire. There was a fire that broke out. Rabbi Nachman's house was burnt. It was a Tuesday evening, I think. And Rabbi Nachman went on top of the hill, overlooking the city of Breslev. And he started laughing. And Rabbi Nachman looks at him and he says, Why are you laughing? Rabbi Nachman was happy. He says, Because if everybody else was suffering and I wasn't suffering, I would have to be mishtatif in their side. I'd have to be joining their pain because it's my responsibility as every, every single Jew to join the pain of Jewish people. But because I am in the pain, I have the obligation to accept it with simcha. So he said, I'm very happy because I know it's Mila Shabbat. When he was saying this, someone came, a messenger came and gave him the book he ended on, which he had waited eight years for. Rabbi Nachman's face turned red because he knew that this was his time to go to Uman to pass away. Because he knew that he was going to die in Uman. We're talking about Tzadik Ahmed. He knows where he's going to be buried. Mm -hmm. Since the six days of creation, Rabbi Nachman's burial spot was already decided in Uman. It's about on the Zohar Kadosh, Parashat Vayachi, I think. Al tikre Amon el Uman. Don't read it Amon Blueprint. Rather read it Uman. Meaning the blueprint of the world starts here. What's the blueprint? The blueprint, ça veut dire le, les plans. Ah. Tu vois? Okay. Mm -hmm. The blueprint, of the, the Torah is the blueprint. And it starts there. Rabbeinu knew he was passing away. It was his time. He was, he was read. But he was passing away. And Rabbi Nathan knew this. So what ended up happening? He went there. And that's when he, the, the story of him playing chess with the philosophers. So Rabbeinu said, why are you playing chess like this? This happened after when he was already settled in Uman. He said, he said, he says with, this is what he said to Rabbi Nathan. He said, with you I build worlds, with them I play chess. <laughs> Meaning, 
it's an entirely different idea. How the tzaddik is able to lower himself. And that's the Gedulah of Hashem. Hashem Yitbarach is so good because he settles himself with the lowest people. And it's when there's low people that come to find Hashem Yitbarach that that's the biggest thing for Hashem. Because you're bringing everything, all the levels in between close to Hashem Yitbarach. So, you ask, did they do Shuvah? Many of them did Shuvah. I think two of them did Shuvah. A Hirsch bear on the last Rosh Hashanah of Abedu's life. That was six months after the story around. 18 days before Rabbi Nachman passed away. Because Rabbi Nachman passed away in Sukkot. The last Rosh Hashanah of his life, Hirsch bear prayed the Rosh Hashanah with the breast suffers in the, in the, in the, in the, in the shul. And when Rabbi Na- when one of the Bresher Hasidim told Hirsch bear, do you want a cup of coffee? He said, no, not until I listen to the Shofar. Crazy mm-hmm. how nobody was able to bring that back to Chuva. The Kavanam, the Tzadik, he goes, he stoops so low to bring them to the Madriga. It's a Madriga we don't understand. So Rabbeinu says, the bigger the Tzadik, the lower he goes. Kichor Basham Amvaratz, because Kichor for everything is in the heavens and the earth. What's Kichor? The Tzadik, the Zohar Kadosh says. Kichor is the Tzadik. Represents Yesod. This is why it says by Mardalid, when you say by Mardalid in the morning in Shacharit, mm-hmm. when we give the, what do you call it, the, the three coins of Taka, Bakol Mikol Kol. No, is it, when is it? No, no, no. Bakol Mikol Kol, is that it? I keep forgetting. You ever see Du? Wow, I'm blanking out right now. Mm-hmm. Here, honestly, here, let me look it up one second. And Wow, totally forgetting. Um, look at this. No, no, no. The Kalun Yehana Adam Moshel Bakol. It's a very big sigula the Arizal brings down to bring three drops of three coins of tzaka. What did it say? The Osha Bakol me define Chava Adam Moshel Bakol. Give three coins. Okay? At the Bakor, Bakor is the time when you get three drops. Why Bakor? Because the Zohar Kadosh says Bakor is a ref- call ref- represents the Sfirah of Yesod. What's Yesod of Rit Kodesh? And what represents the Tzadik? The one who called. Which means what? The Tzadik is Bakor. Is the call. Kichol Bashanam Arat. For everything is in the heavens and the earth. Why everything is in the heavens and the earth? Dimyachet Shemayim Ve'ara. He unifies the heavens and the earth. That's the tzaddik. Meaning the tzaddik is constantly, not only up there, but he's down here. Mm-hmm. And that's why Rabbeinu said in Chayim Moran, Ani b'nechem. I want to dwell amongst you. Meaning Rabbeinu made the promise, he does not want to go into Gan Eden until he repairs everything. That's the job of the tzaddik. You know there's some tzaddikim that they'll go through Gan, uh, they'll go through Gainam to get to Ganadin to repair Neshama. It's a very high level Madrega. I believe Rabbi Yochanan was crying about the Sinan so that he could attain this Madrega. Uh, so, so, because he wasn't sure whether he was at the level to redeem Neshama. Entire idea is my Abrahot, I think. But Rabbi says, I need to tell you, it means Rabbi is not happy in Ganadin. His job isn't there, his job is in Gainam, the Shotatiot. Because the entire job of the tzaddik is to go to the lowest place and to break it up. Not for like Jewish people? Yeah, of course. The other neshama too, there will be tikkun and there will be minyan there. Of course, for those neshama who are worthy and this and that, those who keep shiva mitzvot ben and all those who are, they do mitzvot and whatever it is. But we see the minyan here that the tzaddik, the higher he is, the more he understands the world. Don't think for one second that the bigger the tzaddik the less he understands. No, the bigger the tzaddik, the more he's associated with the world and the tabot, and he knows all this. You know? Which is why he speaks the most about it. Why is it the most? Rabbi Nachman, tzaddik, kadosh, kaele. Kodesh, kodesh, he speaks about tikkun and all the problems, depression, because all the worst sins he understands the most. Why the Ari Kadosh brings certain tikkunim that nobody's ever brought to? The Bar Shem Tov brought the Inyan of Chasidut to teach the, the simplest Jew 
the lowest Jew that he too can draw close to Hashem because he understands them the most. And that's the end here. Kikar Durash Hashem Ba, the main essence of Hashem's greatness is specifically when the person who's far draws close. That's why the tzaddikim, they're always looking at themselves as if they're nothing. Because when they draw close, it's so precious to Hashem because for them, they're nothing. So for, for them, they feel like the biggest rasha drawing close again. We too can do the same thing. Which is why Rabbi Nachman said, do teshuvah on teshuvah. Do teshuvah on teshuvah. Meaning what? When you think you've done teshuvah, recognize that your teshuvah needs another teshuvah. Hashem Ibarach, I said I'm sorry a week ago over this sin. But I realized that the sorry I said a week ago is nowhere near as sincere as the sorry I can say now. Or the sorry you said five years ago over that sin. There's nowhere near the level you can say sorry right now if you've been growing and growing. You're saying sorry on the sorry. Because you recognize that. They're always pushing the back to So what did it say? Immediately when Yitro came and recognized Hashem Barach, Hashem's name was elevated, exalted. This is what it says in the Zohar Kadosh. <coughs> Look what it says. Uh, when other nations come and praise Hashem, Hashem's name is elevated. Hashem's name is elevated. When Yitro comes, essentially, and he's the the crown of all the, the Abu Dazara in the world, what happens? Then Hashem Ibach's kavod gets exalted and begins to rule anew. Because the entire world, when they heard the gvura of Hashem Ibarach, Zahu, they trembled. And everybody looked at Yitro, who was the wise man of the generation. The Zohar HaKadosh is saying this. Um, and that's what it says over here. Um, and all the nations were looking at Yitro. They were looking at Yitro, who was the wise man of all the nations. You know what it says in, in the Zohar Kadosh? You know who were the three people who were advisors to Pao? The three advisors of Pao. Bina. Eyof. Yitro. Meaning Yitro was the wisest man. Yitro was the wisest man. He was the he was a priest of all the way. Paro's associate, Paro's second hand man was Yitro. So what? That's what the Zohar Kedosh says. So what does it say here? That they were all looking to Yitro. But what happened? And then what happened when that happened? They all came to Yitro, and Yitro said, I know now that God is above all the other ones. Then everybody distanced themselves. And everyone began to honor Hashem. All those people who followed Yitro, meaning Yitro made many converts. He brought many people. So, you see here, Rabban was bringing all this idea together. Um... And after Yitro came and he said, and he says, Baruch Hashem, blessed is Hashem that saved you guys from the hands of Egypt. What happens? Hashem's name, his honor, rose up down here and up there. And afterwards, he gave the Torah Bishlemut in its perfection. Because when the perfection of the Torah, that it speaks to the highest, to the lowest. For the Torah is supposed to rule over everyone. Not just those up there, but those down below too. Which is why, if you want to find a tzaddik, why does Rabbi Nachman say it's so important to search for the tzaddik I met? And he says it's important to attach yourself to a tzaddik. But why always search for the tzaddik I met, tzaddik I met, tzaddik I met? What's the point of tzaddik I met, the true tzaddik? Why the true tzaddik? Why not just any other tzaddik? Why the true tzaddik? Because the true tzaddik was at the level of Moshe Rabbeinu, who has the same neshama as Moshe Rabbeinu. Only he has the ability to stoop as low as he needs to to elevate the lowest source. Because only he understands it. Which 
Which is why Rabbi we need to study a book of philosophy. I needed the book in Lebanon. Which is why Rabbi Nachman needed to pick up more Nebuchim. And he said to everyone, don't pick it up. <laughs> Sounds paradoxical. You have many questions. Why? But Rabbeinu is saying this because his job is to elevate the fallen Neshama, just like Moshe Rabbeinu's job was. Just like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was the leader of the generation, the Nasi Ador, the Tzadik Ador. Brought down Rabbi Yehuda and Parasha, I forget where, Parasha Titro, I think, actually in the Zohar. Rabbi Yehuda says that anyone who separates Mina Torah, Kilu did Parash Mina Chayim, is as if he separated from life. Because he says, Kilu Chayach Haver Kamech, we say the Torah is your life, right? But one, kilu, kolam in parash, mi rabbi shimon, anyone who separates from rabbi shimon, kilu in parash, mi kola. It's as if he separated himself from everything. Because the tzaddik I met, he's the one who brings me Torah. Without Moshe Rabbeinu, there's no Torah. There's no Jewish people without Moshe Rabbeinu. So the kiyum Torah happens to these tzaddikim. And yes, of course, it's very important to touch the tzaddik. But if you get to the Madriga where you can attach yourself to the Tzadik Ahmed, the Tzadik Ahmed has the ability to repair the biggest Rasha and turn him to Tzadik Gamu. Because this Torah is all encompassing. And Shumye with Baulam Kar. Dance and clap your hands. Be besim chatanim. The world is a very narrow bridge, but the main thing is not to be afraid. Tikkun Akali. Uman Rosh Hashanah. The list goes on and on and on and on about the Indian. You guys got any ideas? <laughs> it's why, because maybe we can link all this uh, idea from Rabbi Nachman to, to, to Purim, because Purim is the. 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 Oh, the, the fete, the fete. Yeah, the, the, holy, the, holy, the, the, holy, the holy day where you. Where you have to dance, where you need to be simcha, be simcha. So this is maybe why it's the beginning of everything. So beautifully said. On the nail. It's exactly what I'm It's exactly what I'm saying. It's exactly that. Purim is at the beginning. Mm. And it starts at the Keter. Purim is the highest hag that exists. It's the highest light of the entire year. Highest light. But then the, the writing of the Ari Kadosh. Why we get drunk on Purim? Rabbi Nathan explains it beautifully. That because Purim is at the Keter, it's the highest light that exists in the year. What's the Inya? That you have to get drunk. Because the highest wisdom of all wisdoms is not knowing. The highest, the purpose of all knowledge is to recognize you don't know anything. When do you realize a person is really close to Hashem Bach? When he sees how far he is. When he sees how far he is. Mm. When does a person really begin to know something? When he recognizes he knows nothing. Rabbanu says, my not knowing is greater than my Torah. There were times when Rabbanu used to say, I know nothing. This happened on several occasions. And Rabbi Nathan says, when he says that thing, he attained the Madriga, you cannot imagine. By the way, before Rabbi Nathan revealed the second to last Torah he ever taught, the Torah of Enshum Yerush Baran Ukhal, Torah Ayn Chet of Likudum 78 of Book 2, when his students came, Rabbi Nathan said, why are you guys here? I know nothing. I know nothing. And from the knowing nothing, he brought a Torah, but he said, Enshum Yerush Baran Ukhal. An entire lesson about Eretz Yisrael, about the, the free gifts Hashem gives a person. About the 26th generation before Matan Torah. Torah, unbelievable. And Vatchanan and Hashem. Vatchanan, how Moshe pleaded to Hashem about to try to get that. So what's the secret is here? A secret you can't imagine, but from the place of not knowing. Meaning, what's the Tahri? The, the highest Madriga of all is not to know. Not to know. Rabbeinu says in Chayim Oran, a Dibu like this. Rabbi Nathan says in Chaim Oran, Shamati Bishmo Shamar, I heard in the Rabbi's name that he said like this. What did he say? I merited to attain Tachrit Hamadriga Ha Eliona by Yechida. I merited to attain the highest possible level in the soul of Yechida. Yechida is, there's five Neshamot. There's Nefesh Ruach Neshamah, Chayal Yechida. Yechida is the fifth soul 
the Ari Akadol bring down Nikot Adora Shara Psukim, that Mashiach will be a Yechida. Moshe will be a Chaya. The entire Pasuk that Ari Akadol bring down, that the Mashiach will be Me'od, just a little bit more than Moshe. Why? Because he's going to go one soul above Yechida. He's going to attain Yechida Bishlemut in its perfection. The beauty is that Mashiach is Moshe Rabbein. The soul comes back. Because Moshe was in Egypt. But then Moshe came back as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came back, he came back into the Ari Kadosh. And Moshe Rabbeinu came back again into the Baal Shem And Moshe Rabbeinu came back again into Rabbeinu, Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman is the fifth, but the highest piece of the soul until the Mashiach comes. This is why Rabbeinu says, the Madriga between me and the Mashiach, the same. The only difference is, people won't believe me. People are going to believe him. And why? Because the lower the generation gets, the bigger the tzaddik we need. We were in 49 gates in Egypt. Right now we're below the 50th. Moshe Rabbeinu comes back again to bring a new Torah. It's what we call Likud It's what we call Sifu and What's the reason why Rabbi Nachman couldn't have been Mashiach? Like why, why he couldn't have been like the, why he couldn't have yeah couldn't have been it's the same a, soul same, same yeah, yeah it's the same soul yeah. just I guess wasn't the right time but also Rabenu's son was supposed to be Mashiach yeah. yeah Rabbi Nachman said about it Chaim Oran look at it black and white Rabbi Nachman said about his son you know what he named his son Shlomo Ephraim he was Mashiach Ben David and Mashiach Ben Yosef why Shlomo Shlomo was the son of David Mashiach Ben David Ephraim, son of Yosef, where the Mashiach comes from. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Anu said about him that he is the soul of Mashiach. When they were doing the Brit Milah of, of Shom Ephraim, Rabbi Nachman looked at one of the students, I think it was Rabbi Shumar Isaac, he got a new coat, a great coat. And Rabbi Nachman saw the new coat, he said, this year you're going to be greeting the Mashiach with the new coat. That was about a son. Six, I, I forget how long after, a couple months later, the son passed away. Could have been six months or maybe a year, I don't know. Shlomo Ephraim passed away. Rabbi Nachman was bawling. He, he revealed Torah 65 of the Kitaran right after. About how some Neshamot had to go through tremendous suffering, like the soul of Tzadik, to be able to repair the Jewish people and to repair Neshamot and to water the garden. He began to reveal a little bit about what he was, talk, what he was doing, his mission. Lesson 65 is a little bit of Rabbi Nachman's mission. Just a little bit. Rabbi Nachman said about his son that he was the soul of the Mashiach of the generation. Just, he told all his students to pray very hard that he goes back to hell because he's a very special soul. And uh, he passed away in the year. Rabbi Nachman writes plenty of times it's because of our sins that he, he died. The sins of the generation. But Rabbi Nachman said, in Chaim Moran, I'll give you a crazy demo. Look at this one. We can take the Diburim in simplicity and mitchazek with it. Rabbi Nusra says in Chaim Oran, I've attained the Hasaga, a perception of Hashem, that I can bring the Mashiach if I drop everything. I can bring the Mashiach, he says. This is after his son's passing, by the way. I can bring the Mashiach. But, bigger than this, is bringing people back to tshuva. As is brought down in the Zohar, happy is he who holds the hand of the Chayaba, of those who are guilty. That's the most important thing. So the, Rabbi Nachman said, I've set a Shulchan Aruch for the Mashiach. All the Torahs are here. Okay. Rabbi Nachman, Mashiach is going to say, Ita beli kutim moran. That's what Rabbi Nachman says in the Korbeor. Mashiach is going to say, here it's brought in li kutim moran. <laughs> Rabbi Israel, Rabbi Israel, the Odessa, Saba said, Rabbi Israel said, Mashiach said, Tell everyone, why didn't you read Likud Tfilot? Why didn't you read Likud Tfilot? You had Likud Tfilot all the time, you didn't read Likud Tfilot. C'est pour Amasiot. Because when we see a Torah like this, it's not a Torah that. It's a nice thing, it's not that at all. It's a Torah that changes the person. It takes him out of this galut and shows him exactly what he needs to do. And shows him that you can do it. Why is Rabbeinu so chazak? Why is Rabbeinu so important? Because he needs chazak in a Forget the diburim that he says. Forget all the things he says about himself. 
those madrigot that we're talking about, because he attained all those things. Forget that. What is Rabbeinu saying? I want you guys to become kamoni mamash, literally like me. Because Rabbeinu's goal is that when his tamidim come before the Kisei Akavod after 120 years, that they come before the Kisei Akavod and they say, Rabbeinu wants them to look at the Kisei Akavod and be completely rid of their tafot. To be tzadikim. Rabbeinu looked at the students, he says, Nachon atem anashim kshavim. Yes, it's true, you guys are upright people. But I wanted you guys to be like animals howling in the forest. Entire nights. Meaning what? It's one thing to be following Shulchan Aruch, to be upright people, right? I want you guys to be screaming for Hashem. That's the Kavanah. Of course it's the following Shulchan Aruch. But Rabbeinu's Kavanah is that we're out there in the forest begging Hashem about to draw us close to him. That's what Rabbeinu wants. Uh, Rabbeinu's asking his students to give over the heart. Give over the heart. Rabbeinu said, give me your hearts and I'll completely rid of it. Give me your hearts. How does one describe himself within the heart of Rabbeinu? Rabbeinu I mean, Akhman said, there's different types of family. There's people that come to listen to my Torah. There's people that come to eat off my plate. The Hasidim, they have a, it's a nyan. When the tzaddik eats off a plate, they leave a little bit so that the other tzaddikim eat because the shirai, the leftover of the tzaddik's food has a lot of kedusha. So there's some that come to eat off my plate. But there are those neshamot, there are those tzaddikim that are inscribed in my heart. They're, they're in my life. And that's the way I want you guys to be around. So you can listen to a Torah of Rabbi Nachman, you can study the Kutim but it doesn't mean you're inscribed in his heart. How do you inscribe in the heart? If she took you apply what you what you study. You try to apply what he says in simplicity. You try to be besimcha. You try to attach yourself to the Rebbe. You say, I really make a shah at me before you do a mitzvah. She took. It doesn't need to be crazy. Rabbi Nachman wants the heart, the sincerity. Yes, the Chochmah will come with it too when you study the Torah. Of course, you cannot attach yourself to the Rabbin without studying the Torah, without grabbing onto the information. But the main thing is that people can study the Torah, but use it as a wisdom. Throw the wisdom out. Apply it in simplicity. Change yourself from it. Because when Rabbin was saying, clap and dance, he's saying, clap and dance, lift up your feet, go put, jump the head first through the window. To make, make Hashem the Simcha. If she too throw out the wisdom, even though it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah to do a cartwheel, do a cartwheel for Hashem Ibarach. Because if she too, what does Hashem Ibarach want? Rachmana liba bay. Hashem wants the heart. It's in the Zohar Kadosh. Hashem wants the heart. That's all He wants. He wants the sincerity. He wants. He wants. Why? He wants you to do it. Besimcha if she too, with a full heart. So that's how you do it. Whenever you try to apply the Torah, without any kavod, without any. That's uh, these are the inyanim Rabbeinu is teaching us. Constantly renew yourself. Itchashut. So yeah, these dibburim are very strong. People can take them in many different ways. But when you understand the person saying them, you realize that he's not doing it at all for one kavod chad v'shalom. He's mivatel from kavod. He's completely mivatel. He, he has nothing left. He has no tavot. He's trying to tell you that you can become like him. And that's a tzaddik I want to draw close to. Because, we'll finish off like this, what Rabbi Nachman says in Latin 30, you can try to draw close to someone who has irat shamayim. But don't be mistaken to think that just because he has irat shamayim, it's enough. Or just because he's a rav or a tzaddik, it's enough. Or it because it's tzaddik, it's enough. Abenu says, never stop searching for the tzaddik. Never stop searching for the biggest tzaddik. Why? Because the bigger the tzaddik, the bigger the doctor. The more he understands the nishama who's fallen. That's why the Bashem Tov, everybody's speaking about the Bashem Tov. This is why the world will come to see it now. Or why people are slowly coming to see it. Even in the category of the Litvish, of this, of that, all the Jewish people of the whole. Regardless, are coming to see the Inan Rabbeinu. They're coming to see the subject of what, who Rabbeinu is. Why it's so important to never fall into Yerush? Because these deep have never been spoken before. And that's what we need now. 
Because I've been saying, you can become a tzaddik. You can become a tzaddik. I can become a tzaddik. You can become a tzaddik. We can all become tzaddik. Rak tachziku a... What is it? Rak tachziku a tzmechem biyachad. But then, do you want to hold yourself together, Rabbi Nusra? This is the main thing. Bichaberim. Love every single Jew. Every single Jew. Bichaberim with everything. But then, do you want to share And especially among the people who are attached to the name of Rabbi Rabbi says people will be jealous of the Abba that exists between my Tamidim. But he says, Abba, no one will be able to share with you. You guys you guys not only will be upright people, you guys will become tzaddikim gurim. Just hold yourselves together. Be mitchazek. Be mitchazek. This is why when there's someone in Brasa, people who teach in Brasa, it never in the Indiana, chaz v'shalom manhigut, authority, leadership. The manhigut already passed away 212 years ago, Rabbi Nathan. Rabbi Nathan never took the mantle. Rabbi Nathan was the man he at the level because he was a tamid, he took on everything of Rabbeinu, meaning he was so nullified, he had rien de lui-même, he, was, he had nothing of himself, that he made everything that he did, just a clear of Rabbi Nachman and Hashem Bar Satan. So Rabbi Nathan became the man he of the generation because he made himself nothing. Same is true of us. How do you become Kemo Rabbeinu Mamash? When he says Kamoni Mamash, literally like me, throw away what you think you do. That's how you draw close to Rabbeinu. And that's a chidush. People don't want to do it because it's tough. You have to get rid of your kabod. You have to get rid of your manigut. Your leadership, your gaba, yourself. But when you begin to apply what you said, you're beginning to really see who you are. You're, he's illuminating you. Hashem is illuminating you to recognize who good is, who sad is, who we is, who Moshe is. How do you do that? Forget what you think you know. How? Everything he said, left or right, except Bidushitut. He says left is right, and right is left. I believe him. That's what it says in the Sifri. In the Milrash. Everything they tell you left or right. What does it say in Rashi Ben Sifri? Even if he tells you right is left is left is right, believe him. Because he knows what he's talking about. And even though it seems to the world that it's wrong, it's not wrong at all. We just have our goggles on the wrong way. But he's not doing this in Chazmishon for himself. All for us. That's it, Sadiq Moshe Rabbeinu sacrificed every aspect of his nishana for the Jewish people. Every single aspect of his soul. And so did all the other tzaddikim who went through tremendous suffering to bring down Torah that was revolutionary. All the tzaddikim went through tremendous suffering. Even the, the Hasidim, the Gemara Tanya, all the tzaddikim, they brought tremendous, they had to go through tremendous suffering to bring something down to the Jewish people. All the more so the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu has to encounter tremendous yisurim and affliction and pain because he's the barasa, he's the master of the field. So, Baruch Hashem, we have a lot to be mitchazek on. Obviously, we just did the first two sections, not even, actually, yeah, the first two sections. But, that's the main thing. Lipshitut, we'll, we'll slowly move on with it. Sorry for the backtracking. Oh, Hashem. Hazak. Hazak. Hazak.